Joining us today is guitarist Philip Sace. He's releasing his highly anticipated album, The Wolves Are Coming, on February 23rd. Philip, it's good to see you. Pete, it's good to see you too, my friend. So it's been a little while since you've released a studio album. The last album you released was Spirit Rising, and that came out right during the pandemic. Now <laughs> you're finally releasing this album. It's coming out February 23rd. This yeah. is the first album, Philip, that you've released on your own record label. So yeah. tell me about that decision and why was this the time to go out on your own? Yeah, you know, thanks a lot for asking. You know, it just felt very organic. It felt like the right way to do it. These songs came together during the pandemic, uh, were recorded during that time. The project was completely funded by myself with, you know, not having any work for an extended period of time. So it was definitely done on a shoestring budget. And um, it just kind of made sense. Like, well, maybe I'll just put Atomic Gemini into action here. I've been thinking about it for some time, um, having only, I think, only ever released albums with other labels, um, uh, for better and for worse, you know, um, definitely lots of good learning in those relationships. And um, it just felt like, it made sense for this album because this was made really from the ground up. It was really nobody telling me what to do or not to do. Um, it was just me in this room here a lot of the time for a very long time, um, putting songs together, kind of putting ideas together. It's like a diary of that period of time. And it just felt very personal. So I think it made it made sense for me to push Atomic Gemini and to get that going. Um, and certainly to partner with 40 Below Records on some of the distribution and, and to have a partner like that. Um, it's kind of like having a uh, a guide through the jungle, you know? You want to have like a uh, somebody that's going to go along for the ride there and kind of help you avoid some of the pitfalls. Um, but so far, it feels really good, and I'm excited about it. And I think in some ways, again, great learning experience. Um, and I'm really, you know, I think... I, I couldn't be more excited and delighted with how this record turned out. Just, just me. It's just me. <laughs> just me making this record, and nobody in my ear said, "Hey, you suck." <laughs> yeah, I imagine from a creative standpoint, that must be a pretty liberating feeling. Yeah, it, it, that's that's really what I'm getting at, Pete. And I think that's a very eloquent way of, of putting it together. Um, it, it is. Um, it's such a privilege to make music. And that's not lost on me, you know? Um, and I think to just have 100% focus and control on what the music's gonna sound like, what songs I'm gonna pick, um, you know, it's a bit scary too, you know? Obviously you wanna have constructive feedback from people on your team that you trust. Um, but sometimes you get feedback that has absolutely nothing to do with artistic integrity, has everything to do with, with something else. And I think because when I made this, I didn't know if it was going to be the last thing I ever made or not. It might be, I don't know. But um, during a time when things were shut down, I didn't know if there's going to be touring. This might be it. So it's very personal. And I didn't need anybody else to tell me what I need to be or not be. Yeah, when you're working with a record label, just how much influence does the label have on the music that you end up putting out? Uh, you know, it really depends on it. It's a case by case basis and on who you're working with and really comes down to the individual. Um, but a lot of time contracts aren't worth the paper they're written on. <laughs> so a contract might say one thing, uh, but ultimately if somebody's like in any kind of relationship, if somebody I think is paying for something, it's not usually just like a clean slate, like, Hey, yeah, do whatever you want. I'm paying for this, do whatever you want. I think if somebody's paying for something they're going to want to have a say on a few things even if it's a strict license deal they're going to a lot of times try to treat it like it's a record deal or a production deal of some kind so and sometimes that's really really good sometimes that can be um if it's somebody who has your best interest at heart and is really trying to pull the best out of you it can be a phenomenal uh a great win-win learning experience for everyone so i'm certainly not opposed to collaborating with others just in this time it made sense for me to to do this on my own yeah, going out on your own, what was the most rewarding aspect of this and what was the most challenging? Um, I, you know, I think in terms of the most challenging, I think it's still to be determined. You know, the album hasn't come out yet. I think um, 
certainly navigating the uh, closed doors of being an independent artist um, versus having a label on your side where a lot of those those doors are definitely greased and wide open when you're on a label. Um, so I think really just coming to terms with that and, um, uh, you know, try not to take that personally. Ultimately, it's a it's a nasty business. And so a lot of times, um, as I was saying a moment ago, when you're riding through the jungle, um, if you're riding on your own, it can be it can be rough. So you want to have somebody that's there with you that may have a connection or two to help, you know, open those doors in some way. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think it's still to be determined how this is going to go. Um, I think a lot of people will also say, oh, it's an independent project. Oh, indie. I don't know about indie. I don't yeah, no, no, no. Oh, you're signed to what, whatever label. Great. We'll talk to you. You know, so I think there's a lot of that kind of, um, I think there's a lot of that that goes on, but you think, you think you know, there still is kind of a, a stigma on artists if they're not on a, a big label these days? Absolutely. hundred percent. Yeah. Depends. You know, you, you're not going to get a call back from a lot of people. Um, if you are, you know, they say, oh, your social media numbers are this or, you know, hey, you're on your own, you know, I think. And again, it's a case by case basis. It depends on depends on who you're speaking with. I can't. That's a wide brush. I don't want to paint everybody with that brush. But I do think that it is more challenging than um, uh, than being with a label that can open doors for you, for sure. For sure. Yeah. And that's interesting, too, because you mentioned social media numbers and social media numbers. I mean, they can be deceiving. You know, you can have artists who maybe have a huge following on social media, but they're not, you know, making a ton of money. And then maybe you've got artists who've got less followers on social media, but they are making a lot of money. So, I mean, that can be kind of a deceiving thing. You're absolutely right. And I think we've talked about this in the past. Um, yeah, I think I think what you said, I, I totally agree with that. Um, a lot of numbers on social media can also be um, uh, influenced in certain ways. You know, people can pay for numbers to look a certain way. Then they go out on tour and there's nobody at the shows. So it's, you know, it, it is. It's it's a tricky thing. Um, but I think that is the, the we live in a world of numbers and people really want to look to those numbers to gauge whether you're successful or not. As of this recording, you've released three singles so far for the new album. These days, does it just make sense to release the entire album as singles? Yeah, you know, I am totally not opposed to that. I think, um, as we've also spoken about, I think it keeps, uh, you feed the algorithms that way. <laughs> when, when, you're, uh, when you're constantly feeding the beast, you're feeding the machine something new, as opposed to just dropping the whole album. You put an album out of 10 songs that took you a year to make, um, I think the attention span of people are like, great, next week, well, what else you got? Well, I just put out a record, I got 10 songs. Well, cool, what else you got? So it's it's sort of like the, the concept of constantly posting on social media. You gotta keep having something fresh. So I think, I think the idea of releasing individual songs or uh, even two songs at a time or an EP or something is, uh, is very effective and I think a really good way to move forward. Um, you know, I did have a thought for this album at one point I wanted to release one song a month over the course of a year. And obviously we didn't move forward with that, but maybe I'll, maybe I'll do that in the future. But I think just to keep things fresh, because again, um, you know, drop a whole album and then, you know, we're all so distracted and, and our focus is fragmented at all times in all directions. And, or at least I'll speak for myself, for me. And so, oh yeah, that guy did release a record last month. Well, I wonder, you got any new, you got any new songs? You know, so I think, I think uh, it's a good way to go, releasing singles, uh, as many singles as you can, and a consistent run of singles, you know, I'm down with that. Do you feel more pressure, though, because of that, that you have to be producing all the time? Not necessarily, uh, because I, I mean, I feel like I am constantly writing and creating and, and trying, you know, I'm inspired. I love to create music. I am, again, it's such a privilege to have the opportunity to make music in my lifetime. Um, I don't take it lightly. It's uh, it's really something that keeps me buoyant during the hardest times and during the best times, it's just like the cherry on the cake. So it's something that I love so much. And I'm a student of music, I'm a student of life, but you know, I'm a student of music and trying to always improve, trying to always push myself to do better today than what I did yesterday. And tomorrow, God willing, 
that I'll do better than what I did today. So I think that's really the, my focus and always has been um, and always will be is uh, a student looking kind of up and saying, how can I improve on this? How could I do this better? And so I'm always kind of writing something in my phone. I've got maybe, I don't know, a hundred song starts or more. And so, I'm, you know, so I don't know if it's necessarily a pressure thing because um, really they're going to, the song will be done when it feels right to me. I'm not just going to try to force something out that, that doesn't feel, doesn't feel quite right or quite honest, you know? And so I'm thankful to have that, um, that, that luxury to have that space to be able to do that. The fact that we all have our cell phones on us all the time now, how much yeah. has that helped you as a songwriter? The fact that you've got a recorder on you at all times. You know, I don't, it, it's okay. I think, um, I mean, before we all had cell phones, you know, I had like a little pocket recorder. So I'd always just, you know, like throw that on the table and put riffs into it. Um, digital recorder or whatever of some kind. Um, I think the facility of having a phone is, you know, it's, it certainly uh, makes things a little easier in a lot of ways. Um, you know, you kind of come up with an idea real quick and then, hey, let's go in the studio. I can email or text that idea to uh, a, a musician that might come in the studio with me. So I think I think certainly it's it's um, it's helpful. Um, but uh, yeah, I've always been kind of, you know, putting ideas down. If I wasn't if I came up with a riff or something and thought it was oh, maybe, maybe I'll come back to that. So I'd always try to record it in, in some kind of way, shape or form. But but yeah, the phone does make it easier. Going back to the album, a song that I want to talk about is Blackbirds Fly Alone. It's not a song that's been released yet, um, but having a chance to listen to the album before it's come out, it's a song that I've really enjoyed. And I thought it was a little bit of a different direction for you. What was the story behind that song? Yeah, it's a song that uh, that I wrote uh, a while ago, and I kind of came across it again while I had some downtime in the pandemic. And um, it's a song I wrote with Marty Fredrickson. And uh, it's just a song that one of the favorite songs I've ever written. Um, and we collaborated on that and I kind of heard it. And I was like, wow, that that really feels I, I think it really represents a lot of a lot of relationships that I've been through, particularly in the business where uh, maybe somebody um, isn't necessarily honoring um, for me who I am as a person or who I am as a creative person. And again, this is very different, something very different from uh, constructive criticism or constructive feedback, which is very helpful. The intention of that is to help somebody expand. This is more destructive or insulting type uh, feedback. And sometimes it's about trusting, for me, learning to really trust my intuition um, when I know that it's time to uh, to trust that intuition and to also walk away from a specific relationship. And so even if everybody else is doing something, that may not be the right thing for me. And so, you know, the chorus of the song is you and I don't see eye to eye. And this I've always known, right? So it's that sort of feeling in my soul where I've been like, yeah, something about this isn't quite right. And I can pretend, but ultimately, you know, if you pretend in a relationship, it's eventually going to, the wheels are going to come off. And so the second half of the chorus, I knew in time that we would say goodbye because blackbirds fly alone. And that's just sort of the, kind of sums up how I was feeling um, during the making of the record, made it very much on my own. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it just kind of summed up. It was, it was also felt very empowering, felt very uh, a, a way to kind of tap into some self-confidence and um, to really tap into uh, trusting myself as a, as a creative person. Yeah. Now, Philip, you're known for your vintage strats. You're holding one right now. <laughs> um also on social media lately i've noticed you've been posting some videos playing some prs guitars what, what are the stories behind those guitars yeah pete thanks for asking about paul reed smith so um you know about a year or so ago uh less than that maybe six months or so ago uh, a friend of mine glenn from austin he, he gave me a call and said hey man have you tried the paul reed smith silver sky and i said you know i haven't I hear good things, but you know, I haven't tried it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely, I'm comfortable with this guitar. I don't have a thousand guitars or anything. I, I love my guitars. And I'm grateful to have the ones I have. He's like, man, you, you might want to try it. So I went to Burbank here, uh, up to Burbank. There's a Paul Reed Smith showroom here in Los Angeles. And I, um, 
they were kind enough to let me check out a couple of Silver Sky Paul Reed Smith guitars, and I was blown away. I was like, you got to be shitting me. These guitars are amazing. Um, you know, I even brought like a, one of my amps with me just to make sure I wasn't, you know, maybe being fooled or something. And I was like, wow, this is, these are serious business. And so they, they let me take a couple of them home and spent some time with them and started playing some shows and did a little recording with them. And they totally hold their own with, uh, I mean, they're, they are a different um, type of animal than say, this is a 63 Stratocaster. I also play a, a Gibson SG, a lot of 60s Gibson SG, and it's just a different animal. Those, to me, the old guitars, and I've been saying this a lot, are kind of like vintage muscle cars, you know. You feel the room shaking when they're coming. You know, you hear it up the block coming. You know, some something mean is coming. And uh, the Paul Reed Smith Silver Sky has sort of that, has a texture of that. But what it feels more like is is sort of like a, a modern electric car with all of the modern amenities. Um, you know, it has air conditioning. It has it stays in tune really well. You know, like things like things like that. And uh, I'm just super impressed. The playability, the comfort of the guitar, and the quality is second to none. And I think they're making the best uh, guitar of that style on on the market for a new guitar, no question. You mentioned playing the guitars out on tour. Recently, you had a chance to get over to UK and Europe for the first time in over a decade. So what was that experience like for you? Oh man, it was super powerful. Yeah, it was a really amazing opportunity to return. Uh, you know, I had toured there a lot. And I think the last time I was there was 2014 or 2013. So it had been just about nine or 10 years. And um, it was like a dream. I've been waiting to go back and, you know, we've been trying to work it out and looking for a good opportunity to get there. Um, and in the meantime, I've been touring in other places like in Japan and in Canada and even some dates here in, in the U.S. And so I've been focusing in different areas. Um, but to go back and to sell out the garage in London and to sell out in Bristol and, and to have that kind of response from the U.K. audiences was took my breath away. I'm actually feel emotional even talking about it. And uh this extreme gratitude and we're putting together a new tour uh for 20 well for this year 2024 we'll be back over in the uk to do some playing and and uh and to keep keep moving um but it's such a such a lift it was such an incredible experience and we recorded the the garage show um in london uh which was amazing the energy in the room was amazing so We'll see. Maybe we'll maybe we'll release it or part of it or an EP or as we talked about, maybe just one song at a time over a period of a couple months, you know. Um, but thanks for asking about it. It was something I'll never forget. It was super healing. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Do you anticipate some North American dates then this year as well? Yeah. 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 We've got some dates. Um, I think we're going to be in Ohio at some point. Ohio. And then we're going to put some shows together over on the East Coast that um, we weren't able to make last year due to medical reason. I had to postpone some dates, um, a procedure that I had to have done. And then, um, well, we have some shows coming up in Los Angeles. Um, but really, you know, we're going to be back over in Europe in May. I think we're just putting that we're, we're putting that, you know, crossing the T's, dotting the I's right now. But it looks like that will be in May, um, maybe May and June and July as well. So uh, we're going to be keeping busy between now between now and then and, and hopefully more shows will crop up here in the u.s um but really that requires people returning our calls <laughs> well hopefully they return your calls philip you know we'll see we'll see you know it's uh it's business what can you say well one thing that's been a really hot topic in music lately is ai artificial intelligence yeah. How would you feel, Philip, if a song came out and it was a Philip Say song that used your likeness and it was your voice? How would that make you feel if that happened? I think it'd be pretty cool. I'm down. You know, we just got to make sure that, you know, the uh, the pay goes in the right direction. So you would be for that if if the artist is getting compensated, then you're for it? Yeah, I think if the technology is being used in, in a constructive way and, uh, you know, can can really help um, 
and artists make money in this day and age where it's extremely hard for any artist, even the most popular artists aren't making the kind of money you think they're making. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with it. Um, but again, I think we're, you know, we're credit and the income streams are, they'd have to be directed in, into the right, into the right, uh, direction. And, and by that, I mean, making sure that artists are paid for, uh, you know, if, if their sample is used, right. Ultimately, if somebody uses a sample of someone, they get paid. Right. So I don't, it's just a, a, a sort of evolution of that really. And I, I'm all for things moving forward. Um, as long as people are being compensated correctly. So say a hundred years from now when we're gone, people are making new Philip say songs. Would you be all for that then? Well, yeah, I think again, as long as those income streams were pointed in the right direction to my great, great, great grandkids, then that's okay. You know, I'm okay with that. I think it keeps the music alive. I think it keeps pushing things forward. And I think it's, uh, we can't stop the tide. It's going, you know, if there's nothing we can do about it at this point, that train has left the station. So, you know, I think you can kind of stomp your foot and get mad about it or, um, or kind of use it to our advantage. And so I, I'm more interested in finding ways to use it to my advantage. Um, and again, not to say it over and over again, but really to make sure that those, um, that those income streams are being, you know, that they're set up correctly. Kind of staying on the AI topic. One thing that's kind of interesting is now you've got chat GPT and you can kind of plug anything in there. Would you ever think about using chat GPT or a tool like that to get creative inspiration? Yeah. I, you know, again, I think the main thing for me with, with using technology is that it's a tool. It's not the driver. Right. For me, I want the, the human spirit to be the driver in all of this. So these are incredible tools. But I, again, I don't want to rely on the tools to necessarily create the art. I want for me, I'm more interested in human creation than uh, AI creation or some type of, you know, creation in, in that kind of way. Not that I'm opposed to that. But for me, what what excites me is using those tools um, to really enhance um my expression as an artist. Yeah, for sure. If you could collaborate with anyone, but the stipulation is they're not a blues artist and they're not a rock artist, who would you pick? Tame Impala is not, I wouldn't say a rock artist. Um, you'll know, you definitely know the songs once you heard them. He had like a wicked hit like years ago called Elephant. Um, there's a tune called The Less I Know, The Better. As soon as you hear it, you're, it's like an instant earworm. You're done. That song is in your head forever. So um, I'm going to say Tame Impala. Well, that's basically all the questions I have. Philip, anything else you want to get out there? Anything else you want to add or let people know what's going on with you? You know, uh, well, thanks for the platform and the opportunity. Again, you know, I think just sharing that, you know, this music is uh, was really created during very bleak time. And it was done... Um, without really any any filter, you know, without any uh, additional feedback or anything like that. I mean, other than people that I trusted, but I just really followed my intuition on this and and really put my heart out for this. And I, I'm just grateful that it turned out so well. You know, it, it definitely turned out, I think, closer to my heart than maybe anything I've done before, um, because it was a lot of a lot of different range of emotions in this and. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just really grateful for the opportunity to make music. Well, congratulations on the new album. February 23rd, The Wolves Are Coming. Check it out. Yes, please. Thank you, Pete.